All right, hello everyone. I'm William Horton. This is We Don't Code Alone, Building Learning Communities. Uh, and so the main question that I wanna answer in this talk is, sorry, ah. <laughs> how can we build communities that learn together? Uh, this is a question I'm really passionate about, uh, and why am I so passionate about it? Because, you know, I owe my career to being able to learn, and not only be able to learn, but be able to learn with other people uh, and to get to be a part of communities that helped me grow as an engineer. Uh, and so to start off, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so this is me. Uh, I'm currently a senior software engineer at Compass, uh, which is a real estate technology company based in New York City. Uh, there I work mostly on data pipelines and ingestion. Uh, so we're bringing in data about real estate listings, trying on my team to most efficiently process. Um, we get millions of real estate listing updates, and so we're trying to make those available to uh, other applications. Uh, but this talk uh, isn't totally about me now. Uh, it's also informed by me four years ago, so I made a couple edits to the bio to tell you a little about myself then. Then I was a senior in college. Um, I was working on my BA in social studies, and Really, the only thing I cared most about efficiently processing was all the, all the readings I had to do each week. Uh, you can see from the photo that I did do a good job of balancing my studies. Uh, I had a lot more hair back then, too, so you can see that. Um, and so, like I said, I got my BA in social studies. You might wonder what that means. That's a fair question, because you can see from the, the Stack Overflow survey that it's not really a common area of study uh, among people uh, who do what we do, um, it's right down there, coming in at about 1.8% uh, of people studying a social science. And so to, to answer that question, I did pull down the answer from the website for my degree, um, but th this is pretty long. Uh, basically, the gist of it is trying to take both classical and contemporary social theories and, and apply them to problems uh, or questions that exist today. Um, that, that's kind of what the degree was founded to do, and so I'm hoping to share a little bit about what I learned in that uh, to you today. Um, and so the degree culminates in a thesis, and this is the title page of my thesis, uh, which was about religion and democracy in Latin America. Um, on that note, I'm happy to send out a copy if anybody's interested in this topic. Uh, you'd be the first one to read it besides my graders, me, and my mom. Uh, so just uh, let me know. Um, if you're not interested in that topic, though, you might wonder, you know, you know I spent my focus on studying religion and politics, uh, and you might wonder, I mean, in the tech world, like, what is the relevance of these subjects? But then when I was thinking about it, you know, we do have evangelists. Uh, we also have dictators for life that we hope are benevolent. Uh, and one other thing that we have in common is an affinity for interpretation of ancient texts. In our case, you know, I'm talking about legacy code. Um, but we do gather uh, together to hear people explain how we can understand things that were written sometimes a really long time ago. Um, that aside, really uh, what I want to convey is that social studies, you know, the social sciences are not just for studying kind of the big groups in our lives, not just religion, politics, things like that. Um, but, you know, when I was studying in college, it's about taking these theories that people have been debating and talking about, I mean, for, for centuries, and, and being able to apply them to topics that interest you, topics that are relevant today. Uh, I mean, some of my classmates wrote about, like, kind of really out there things. The history of actuarial science, the use of pig dissection in the medical industry, uh, that one actually was, was really fascinating. Um, but that is to say that these theories can inform whatever it is you are, are most interested in. Um, and the topic at hand is learning communities. Um, you know, why am I talking about this today? 
in tech, we use a lot of like the blank community, right? We're here today as kind of the Rails community or the Ruby community. Um, we use this term a lot to describe groups of people that have formed around these technologies. Uh, and so in this talk, I kind of wanted to start to investigate that and, and apply some ideas about community um, to these spaces that we've created. Um, in my case, I've gotten to be a lot, part of a lot of communities. Um, the App Academy community, I, I came into this through a boot camp, uh, and that was a pretty, uh, I mean, formative experience. That was my first experience kind of being heads down, like writing code every day. The Ruby and Rails community, Ruby was the first language I really knew. Uh, Rails was, you know, the first framework I learned. Uh, as I did more full stack work, the React community, kind of my, my side interest now, the deep learning community, but these are all, you know, things that are formed not on, only around groups of people, but around ideas and technologies that those people have an interest in. Uh, and that's kind of where this intersection is between learning and community uh, in like the technological space. Um, and, and the real question is how do we do it right? Like this is the question that I'm most passionate about. And, and this could be in the form of many different groups, whether it's an open source project or a company or a local meetup or some kind of remote study group. There's so many different ways that we come together, communicate, congregate around wanting to know more. Um, and so it's really important, I think, to be able to draw some lessons uh, from people who have thought about ideas like this before us. The real kind of summary of this talk is, if I had a chance to apply the lens of my undergraduate studies to my last four years working in tech, what would I say? Or how can I finally put that degree to work? So to give an outline of what I want to talk about, um, there's basically three main parts. Obviously the first is going to be about community, looking at some classic theories of it, some more contemporary theories, uh, then talking about learning. So how can we develop effective educational strategies? How does that tie into the community aspect? Uh, and then basically putting it together, talking about communities that learn together uh, and some questions uh, that come up when you start putting them uh, together. So to start out, community. Um, like I said, we're gonna dive into some older theories about community, we're gonna dive into some newer theories that specifically apply it maybe to online communities, tech communities. Uh, and so we'll start with some classical theories in sociology. Um, so these are two thinkers who, at the beginning of sociology as a practice, were thinking about questions of community. So Fernand Ternis wrote Gemeinschaft und Gesellschaft. My German is not great, I did not study German. Uh, in college, uh, and Durkheim, who wrote a book called The Vision of Labor and Society. And at the beginning of like sociology as a field, they really were interested in understanding different types of communities, into drilling in the forms of communities and how they change over time. So to talk a little bit about uh, Ferdinand Tonis, these German words translate to community and society. And in his worldview, these were kind of two distinct types of ways that people gather. Um, and Gemeinschaft was based on kinship or proximity, so you might have a family or a village. Uh, and Gesellschaft was based on more kind of rational, uh, I mean, he called the rational will, but these are things like business, uh, exchange, trade, and like formal law or the, or the state. Um, and these were like ideal types in his system. So the important thing is that like groups have both elements. You know, there's some amount of proximity or kinship, but also maybe a, a rational desire for, for some outcome. Um, so this is kind of his system. Durkheim uh, wrote Division of Labor and Society, and the main question in that was talking about, in, in his concepts, mechanical, mechanical solidarity versus organic solidarity. Um, and so mechanical solidarity, in his view, came from the similarities that people share. Um, so homogeneous societies, um, whereas organic solidarity is something that comes about through the division of labor. Um, so basically as people become more differentiated in their roles, um, there's a different way that people come together. There's more of the need uh, for things like laws uh, and things that kind of govern those systems. 
Um, and so those are kind of two uh, kind of earlier thinkers in, in terms of what is community. And to bring it back to the point of this talk, like what lessons can we draw from these early thoughts? Um, one is categorization. I think the interesting thing about tech communities and communities that are, are learning together is that they cross many of the neat lines uh, that we usually use to classify community. So they're both in person and online. They can be spread across national boundaries. They could be part of your professional interests or they could be part of your personal interests or maybe both. Uh, you know, they could be run by people who are paid, people who are volunteers. Uh, and so I think a lot of ways that people try to draw distinctions between different types of communities, it, it makes it harder to, to categorize these tech communities um, because of how they've developed and, and how they're run. Um, I think another thing that kind of runs through uh, Durkheim and Tony's is personal versus rational interests, which I think, again, is something both are present in, in these communities. We, we want to feel a kinship. We want to feel like other people are going through the same things, especially when we come to conferences and hear talks. Uh, there's something nice about that, about hearing that people have the same problems, have the similar experiences, but at the same time, we also desire rational outcomes. We desire maybe to be better at our jobs, maybe to finally overcome you know, that 12 month migration, things like that. So there is a blend of that when we come together in these ways. Uh, and this is another thing I think that links those earlier thinkers with the situation we find ourselves in now is for them, I mean, they were thinking about community in the kind of the dawn of the quote unquote modern era, right? There, it was a time of great change. Uh, and, and in the same way, our communities today are being formed in the face of great changes, social and technological, uh, that can make uh, a big difference in how we understand them. Um, so to make it a little bit more contemporary uh, and a little bit more specific, uh, this is a paper that sought to define what a sense of community could be, um, to lay down maybe some elements of what does it mean to be part of a community, to feel like we are, are part of it. Um, and so there's four main elements, uh, membership, influence, integration and fulfillment of needs, and shared emotional connection. So I'm gonna go through these and also talk a little bit about how this relates to the Rails community. Um, so membership itself was broken out, down into certain elements. I think there's certain ones that are crucial and certain ones that are a little bit harder to understand. So emotional safety is one of them. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely like vital to the health of a community. People want to come in and feel like they're safe, feel like they can occupy that space. Um, but boundaries and personal investment are other things that these authors point out as important to community, and that can be really tricky. Uh, you know, how, how do you set up boundaries or a definition of a group without excluding others, and, and how do you ask for some amount of personal investment to belong without, again, uh, creating a culture of exclusion? So I think those are, are tricky questions to answer when you're talking about the membership component. Um, influence is another one that has this kind of uh, paradoxical nature it's a back and forth. We want to feel like we can influence the group, but at the same time, the group, in order to exist, exerts an influence on us to conform to certain norms. Uh, and so this is the struggle between the cohesiveness of the group and our ability to express our individuality. Um, and, and in this paper, they say, basically, members are more attracted to a community in which they feel that they are influential. We don't want to be parts of groups that we don't feel like we have a say in. Um, and and uh, to kind of illustrate this point, I want to talk about this essay that DHH wrote, uh, Rails' Omakase. Basically, this is making the point that a lot of the things have been pre-selected and, and arranged for you. Uh, and basically, he's, he's saying unapologetically, it's not designed to appeal to everyone. Uh, so on the one side, this is uh, expressing the group's kind of influence over you. It's saying you take on Rails, uh, and it means accepting some of these things. But at the same time, later in the essay, he leaves it open to influence from the individual. It, it, it doesn't mean that you can't express your opinions about the right thing, and, and even maybe make changes within the framework. And so I think this is one illustration in a concrete way of this back and forth. It's like the, the group or the technology in some ways shapes you, but in order for it to be an effective community, it has to be open to letting you shape it as well. 
the next element is integration and fulfillment of needs. And so this integration component basically means coming together around shared values. Uh, and that's how you discover that you have these similar needs or goals in, in coming together as a community. And Rails, again, has an interesting illustration of this. There is a doctrine. I mean, it's, it's put out there as, like, it calls it a doctrine. Uh, and these are kind of values that shape the Rails community. And I think not a lot of other language communities or technology communities necessarily put it so explicitly. Uh, and so this is interesting. People coming into the community uh, can read this and start to understand, well, what are the values that are shared by its members? Uh, and finally, shared emotional connection. So in the paper they say this is based on a shared history. Um, and they actually do cite uh, Ferdinand Tony's and Gemeinschaft, which is used to be, again, based on location, but is basically this personal connection that we feel with other people. Um, and it does include the interaction of members in, in shared events, which, which might be something like this. Um, but in technology, I think, in terms of a shared history, we have some uh, interesting opportunities. For one, I mean, this is the video I watched before, as I was getting into Rails that really hooked me. Uh, and it's, it's DHH going through building like a Twitter thing, basically, in 15 minutes. And I watched this and I was amazed. And this is part of the shared history that's able to be recorded uh, and put up there. And people who are coming in as new members can say, well, this was made back then to illustrate it, but they can still take part in the shared history. Uh, in the same way, in technology, we also have a literal shared history uh, you know, through git commits. So anyone who's joining can also go through and see the changes that have been made, not just in terms of commits, in terms of releases. Uh, and so this is another interesting way where uh, our history is recorded in certain ways, and people can go through and start to understand, well, not just what is this community now, but, but where is it coming from? And that makes them feel a bigger sense of belonging. Um, so the last source I want to talk about in terms of communities is, again, a little bit more contemporary and a little bit more specific. Um, this is specifically building successful online communities, uh, and it takes a kind of experiment-driven, empirical approach and it does start out, I mean, this is part of why I like it. It says, what can, basically, what can social science teach us about building online communities? Uh, and they think, at least, that social science is uh, a prime resource for, for mining lessons to achieve these goals of having thriving communities online. And they break th down the problem in a certain way. So basically, how to start a community, encouraging commitment, contribution, regulating behavior, uh, and then dealing with newcomers. Um, and the other interesting thing about this book is they lay out their claims, basically a series of design claims. And again, they're coming at it from a more actionable, like experimental perspective. And so these are just a couple that I picked out that I thought were interesting relating to newcomers. Um, so one is about newcomers having friendly interactions with existing members. They're more likely to stay. If, if when they join, you can just make sure that they have that. <coughs> the other thing is about letting new members mess things up. Uh, so they say on online communities, having a sandbox where people can just mess around, learn things, and not actually like destroy the online community itself uh, can be a really effective strategy. And that is going to, I think, connect well with uh, the section where we're going to talk about learning. So on to learning. Basically, Having understood like, a couple ways that people are thinking about community and crafting community, how can we connect that in now with these communities where people come to learn? Like, like I was talking to at the beginning, a lot of people come to Rails because they want to learn how to use it to solve their need. The same thing with Ruby. The same thing with a lot of uh, you know, technologies. So how can we tie in then the, the piece about learning? So one kind of classical thinker I wanted to talk about is Dewey. He was American public intellectual, spanned a lot of different disciplines, and he wrote a book called Democracy and Education. Um, and one of his big things was he's promoting progressive education, and, and it puts a real emphasis on learning by doing. Uh, and so here's a couple quotes from uh, Democracy and Education that I think tie in well with the topic at hand. Um, basically, he's thinking about education, how it relates to social groups. In his mind, it goes all the way up to sustaining democracy itself, sustaining a nation 
but I think it's equally applicable to, to smaller groups. He says, the group can't survive without more mature members contributing to the educational growth of, of newbies, basically. Um, and I think the other thing uh, that's important to take away from kind of his thought is, is the importance of activity, the importance of, of getting hands on. And he, he illustrates it with this, which is basically, when you learn what a hat is, you look at the other people, put it on their head, right? You use the hat, you, you, you share that, basically. And he's saying, well, how are you supposed to learn about the discovery of America just by reading about it in books? If you don't have some concrete way of, of understanding the importance of that maybe, or, or maybe uh, making it more hands-on and involved, then it's just a bunch of words on a page. So, so this is another thing is, you know, talking about learning as it's embedded in the social groups that we're part of. Uh, and this is another book that, I mean, I love this book. I really, uh, it's really changed my perspective on things. Um, this is Making Learning Whole. Uh, and basically, the author has seven main principles. Uh, play the whole game, make the game worth playing, work on the hard parts, play out of town, uncover the hidden game, learn from the team and other teams, and learn the game of learning. Uh, and so I've, I'm gonna talk about a couple of these principles and explain what it means in, in the context of his thought. So first of all, play the whole game. Like what is the whole game? Um, and, and the way that he thinks about it, it's basically, he takes the metaphor of baseball. And he says, when he was learning to play baseball, what he liked about it was actually being able to go out with his friends and, and hit the ball and run the bases uh, and, you know, you don't learn to play baseball, you don't necessarily start in like batting practice. Like not a lot of people think batting practice itself is fun. It's, it's kind of a, something you do to get to the next thing. He's saying people wouldn't love baseball if you had to spend like five years in batting practice only to get to play a game at the end. But for a lot of subjects, that's the way we teach it. He takes math education, for example. He's saying, it, you know, you make people learn their times tables and do addition and learn all these things that are just merely elements of the system you want them to learn. And people do that for years, maybe for their entire primary and secondary education before they actually find out, well, what is the whole point of doing math, right? Uh, and so this is kind of his idea of the whole game, is saying we need to introduce people to the whole system as opposed to like making them master each element before they even understand what, it, what it's for. And the other important point here is, he says it's okay to create a junior version of the game. So in the baseball metaphor, he's saying, you don't have to go out to a real diamond, nine players versus nine players, to, to expose someone to the whole game. It could just be you know, a couple people, two bases in a backyard. But the point is, you get introduced to everything together. You're hitting the ball, you're running the bases, you're catching it, as opposed to you know, teaching it in isolation for so long before you even know like the joy of what it is you're, you're meant to do. So this is the central concept is he's talking about playing the whole game. Uh, and I think uh, Rails actually does a good job. This is kind of a personal anecdote, but when I first started learning Rails, I basically sat down with this book and I was like, I want to get through this whole book. And I think I read in the intro that the person had gotten through it in like a solid 48 hours. And it took me a lot longer than 48 hours, but that was still like an inspiration is basically like you can go through this book and, and it lets you do everything, right? It, it's, it's letting you build a whole application that does something and you, you learn about the database, you learn about APIs, you learn about routes, a bunch of things. It, it's not kind of isolating and it's saying you have to learn this and this and this first. Um, and this is the first time I really got it, right? This is the first time I understood that we could use technology and these tools to achieve certain objectives. Um, and, and I think a lot of people have these things. In the book, they call them threshold experiences, but it's when you finally are exposed to something and, and you understand it. And uh, I think a lot of people have seen the screen, right? You open up localhost, you're running Rails for the first time. I think this is one of the more recent versions of it, but this is, I think for a lot of people, a great experience. It's, you see something working and you're like, I actually built, uh, you know, a server that's giving me a page on a website. Uh, I, I think that that is uh, an amazing experience and I think we should be thinking about how we can 
start giving people those experiences early on in like everything that we teach. And another one of his principles, besides learning the whole game, is learning from the team and, and other teams. And he's saying, we don't learn in isolation. We don't learn as one person. I think even, you know, I was like one person sitting down with this book on a laptop, but I'm still connected to so many other people through this book, through the ideas, through Googling and Stack Overflow. Uh, it, we're almost never working in complete isolation. Uh, and so he points out two things that I think actually connect really well to uh, the concept of programming, even though he's talking mostly about like traditional educational settings. So he says, pair problem solving is great. Uh, and you know, pair programming was one of the first ways that I got into programming. When I went through App Academy, that's basically their whole uh, motto. You're pair, pair programming almost all the time. Um, and so I think that's a, effective way of people sharing knowledge together and learning together. The other interesting one that I don't think we see as much, he talks about cross-age tutoring. So having older students and younger students uh, working together to tutor each other. And I think there's real lessons we can draw from that in uh, the programming world as well. I think sometimes we think about knowledge as a one-way street. We think about you know people who are experienced, people who know things, are kind of giving it, sharing it with other people. But there's so many lessons we can learn from people who are just coming into it. Sometimes those are the most important lessons. Like, is it easy for them to use? Is it easy for them to get started? Uh, and so I think this concept that we can kind of pull this in and, and say, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that they can come back from people who are just starting out. Uh, and the last point he makes in his book is learn the game of learning. And I think this is so important in this setting because in our careers, we're going to do this over and over and over again. Uh, I mean, even if you are always using Rails and Ruby, you know, there's people coming out with new gems that might be useful. Um, I mean, new ways to deploy, new infrastructure. Basically, technology is constantly changing. Uh, and so it's almost not as important that we learn to master a certain technology as it is to actually learn how to learn. And, and I mean, in his terms, learn the game of learning, how we can make it enjoyable and fun and something that we want to continue to do. Uh, and so when he's talking about this, he brings up a paradox. He's talking about the metaphor of a driver's seat versus the passenger's seat, uh, which is basically in a setting where someone is educating us. A lot of the times, they're in the driver's seat. We're in the passenger's seat. We have this passive mentality where they're taking us where they think we should go, teaching us the lessons that they think we need to know. But that never lets us learn the game of learning. That doesn't let us learn how to drive a car. Uh, and so I think this is another important lesson, and one that I think we do pretty well, which is you know, with programming technology, you can kind of let somebody run wild. You can let them write some code, try to debug it. Uh, and I think you know, e educating people in, in programming and, and technology should be more about kind of helping them get through the roadblocks as opposed to driving the car for them. Uh, so to kind of put this all together, you know, we were talking about theories of community and, and theories of education, how people learn. Um, so just to talk about a couple points that I think are important when we're talking about communities that are founded around uh, learning and, and welcoming people and helping them get up to speed. Uh, and so this book I wanted to shout out because this book, when I read it for this talk, was one of the, I think, so many ideas that matched up with what I was thinking about. Uh, so Peter Hinchins, he was largely involved in Zero MQ, which is a, a messaging queue. This book, he's basically taking an in-depth look at his own open source community and how they collaborate. Uh, and he basically comes up with this idea of social architecture. So we have like software architects, right? But he thinks it's equally as important that we have people who are really thinking about and designing these community spaces. And he has 20 tools. Uh, in his toolbox, and so just a couple that I thought were relevant and interesting. So free entry, making it possible for anybody to come in, and that goes all the way back to when we were talking about boundaries, right? Is we need a definition of the group, but nothing so restrictive that people can't easily become a part of it. Fair authority, so again, that influence question of you know, who has a say. Uh, smooth learning, so making it possible for people to ramp up in a sustainable pace, and regular structure, I think that's super important, is you know, people want to know the values of your community. People want to know 
what they're getting into, what they're becoming a part of. Uh, and so I really would also highly recommend this book. Um, it, you know, it's very focused on these questions we have as, as technology communities. So this is one question I want to talk about as I'm kind of wrapping up is the question of should we even be designing communities? Because in some of these sources, they address this question of some people say we shouldn't, right? Or we should just let things go as they are. Some people think it feels kind of wrong to be talking about shaping the social experience. But I just think it's too important to leave to chance, right? I mean, we spend so much of our time in these groups with other people that we, we can't just say, oh, well, we'll let it run its course. Uh, I mean, that affects too many people. Uh, and basically, the other thing is your community is going to have norms and it's going to have values, whether or not they're explicit or implicit in the behavior of your members. Uh, and I just think for the sake of new people joining, for the sake of people who want to be a part of it, it really is better if you make those uh, values explicit so people can know what they're getting into and people can understand when there might be a need to regulate behavior. You can point to something concrete and say, this is how we do it in this community. Um, and so on that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about diversity in the context of learning and community uh, because our learning communities have to be inclusive communities. We, we can't build things and then just tell some people that they don't belong. Uh, and, and that's really a difficult task because as a society, we're conditioned um, to have these biases and prejudices. And, and you know, some people also express them explicitly. Um, so this is a really important question that we need to consciously address. Um, and, and the other thing is traditional educational paths are, are still very unequal. Um, you know, people who are underrepresented minorities have less access to CS classes, maybe are less likely to receive the encouragement to go into CS through you know, maybe a traditional degree. And this is one article I was reading recently uh, that was basically saying sometimes it's even hard to get into class because the demand is so high. Uh, and, and who this ends up impacting in college are the people who up till that point haven't had that encouragement, haven't maybe had that access. And, and so this is a super crucial question, especially when we're talking about learning communities. Uh, people are going to be coming from all walks of life, all different places, and we really need to, like I said, consciously lay out plans to welcome everyone. Uh, and so this could you know, look a couple of different ways. Ruby on Rails has a code of conduct, and so this is laying out behavior that you know, people can uh, adhere to, I guess, uh, to make everyone feel like they belong. Uh, and this is, I think, important. This is, again, getting to explicit values of the community. Um, another one I like is Recurse Center in New York has social rules. And these are maybe about things people do that aren't quite as uh, explicit, but you know, one of them is no well actually. So you're talking about something and someone's like, well, Actually, I think a lot of people uh, have experienced that. That just is a negative feeling when someone does that to you. Um, I mean, you should read about these. Um, but these are really good ways of saying, well, there's some really things people do that are, are very wrong. And then there's some other behaviors that also maybe make people feel unwelcome in other subtle ways. And so we also maybe should think about those as well. So to get to the, the main points of this talk and, and to sum up, we want to feel like we belong in communities. And, and we can't be effective learners or teachers or, or members of a community if there's any behavior or, or ideas that make us feel unwelcome. This is a super crucial point. We want to own our own learning. So this is another thing that consistently comes up through the literature, both on community and on learning is we want to have an active role. Uh, so we need to, as people who are shaping these communities, think about giving people the opportunity to act in that, that way. We want to understand the bigger picture. Uh, so as learners, we don't want to be restricted to some path that doesn't connect with what we ultimately want to be doing. We don't want to go down some road and have to pursue it so far without understanding the broader context. And finally, like I said, this, this is too important to be left to chance. This is why I wanted to give this talk, because I think we need to start thinking about these ideas and these theories and how they shape 
uh, our experiences. So to conclude, one, this isn't a thesis. It's just the start of a conversation. Um, so like I said, I wrote a thesis. That was like almost two years of work. Uh, this is a couple months of research and a couple interesting uh, papers and books that I found. So really, the point of this is to just jumpstart and, and get us talking about it um, and hopefully you know, pique some interest in applying these ideas in this setting. Uh, and I wanted to close with a quote from the Sense of Community paper because I, I think it's really powerful. It says, somehow we must find a way to build communities that are based on faith, hope, and tolerance rather than on fear, hatred, and rigidity. We must learn to use sense of community as a tool for fostering understanding and cooperation. We hope that research on this topic will provide a base on which we can facilitate free, open, and accepting communities. We present the concept of community here not as a panacea, rather as one of the means to bring about the kind of world about which we and others have dreamed. So, Let's go build the world that we've been dreaming about together. Thank you. And we do have a couple minutes for Q&A. Yeah, that's a good question. So you asked, well, when we think about online communities, what, what sites come to mind? I mean, for me, like a lot of programmers I interact with is, is through Twitter. Uh, so there's a pretty active community on there, people who are sharing um, ideas and, and that kind of thing. Definitely through most, like, definitely through Rails and when I was learning React. Um, I mean, I'm on there probably way too much. Um, so that's a good place. Um, I mean, those other places people share stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's Hacker News, but that would require a whole other talk, so. <laughs> Thank you.